اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان اللعین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمدللہ رب العالمین وصل اللہ علی نبینا محمد و آلہ الطاہرین اللہم صلی علی محمد و آل محمد رب شرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری وحل الاغدتا من لسانی یفقہ قولی اما بعد فقط قال اللہ سبحانہ وتعالی فی کتابه الكریم وهو أصدق الصادقين وقوله الحق أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قد أفلح المؤمنون صدق الله العلي العظيم سلوات اللهم صلي على محمد وآلي محمد وعز Respected brothers, sisters and elders, assalamu alaikum jameeon wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First and foremost, I would like to send my condolences to all the mu'mineen and mu'minat in this gathering and around the world, and especially to the imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman ajjal Allah faraj al-Sharif, I would like to send my sincere condolences to him on the 40th day anniversary after the martyr death of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. As you know, on this day, millions and millions of people are blessed to be able to walk from Najaf to Karbala. They are so lucky to be able to experience the Iraqi hospitality where people have opened their houses, they're giving food, they're giving drinks, they're giving everything in the way of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Millions and millions of people are walking just so they can pay allegiance to the Imam and say, Ya Imam, we are your sincere followers. We want to follow you. Yesterday we gave an example of the father who sent his son to the private school with the best teacher. And we gave that example in the light of our own lives, where we said, Allah will ask us on the day of judgment, I sent you to the best school, which is earth. He didn't send us to any other planet. He sent us to, the, to earth. And he sent us the best teachers, which is the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam and his Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa sallam. He gave us the best guidance the best teachers, so we can get most from this world. Now the question that we need to ask ourselves, why is it important for me to have a relationship with my Creator? Why do I need to have this relationship with my Creator? One important point that needs to be mentioned is that when we have a relationship with our Creator, it affects our mental health. When you have good relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're able to stay happy. We're able to have a soul which is in peace and harmony. We want a soul which is in complete peace. Happiness contributes towards having a good relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I, one of the speakers I really love is Agha Panahiyan, and he gives a very beautiful example. He says the first function of the religion is to make you feel better. The first function of religion is to make you feel better. And we have a narration from Imam Ali salam where he says, Hal al-Din illa al-Hub. Is religion anything else than love? A person who is restless, who doesn't have peace, who doesn't have harmony, especially living in this Western world, where we're running after the materialistic world, it's often that we are stressed in our life. A person who is in such a state, when he tries to pray, or when he tries to conduct Islamic action, he will feel it is a punishment. He will feel it is hard to do it. He will see 
that everything with the religion is a punishment. However, when a person is at peace, when he has harmony, nor at menneska, uh, har fred og harmony, then he will feel Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he prays, he will feel Allah. Now us sitting on the ground and attending the majalis, it is a good tarbiyah for us. Number one, it keeps us humble. It keeps us close to the earth. Secondly, when we wish to pray, how often have we not seen people are not able to sit properly, especially young people, I'm not speaking about the elders. The elders, they're old, they have back problems, so on and so forth. Young people are not able to sit on the ground and pray. It is painful for them to sit and pray. And when there is pain, then they are not able to understand the love that is in the prayer. Now, we want to create a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We wish to understand our creator. Our creator is not someone who wish to punish us. Rather, he's shown love towards us. He's shown mercy towards us. We need to build that relationship. And how do you build a relationship? In our world, if I want to build a relationship with someone, how do I build a relationship? Through communication. Only way to build a relationship, it is through communication. So how do I communicate with my creator? How do I conduct a communication with my Lord, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We find, for example, two ways. If I wish that Allah speaks to me, I'll read the Quran. And if I wish to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'll read the Salah. So Allah has given us two tools, which is the Quran and the prayer, Salah. He's given us two tools. Two varkte. You say varkte in Swedish? No, tools? Varkte, yeah. You got two varkte. Two tools to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let us, let us look at these two. The Quran. Let's look at the Quran first. Quran. What should we say about Quran? Quran is a forgotten book among Muslims. When do you use the Quran? We use the Quran when you, for example, buy a new house. I bought a new house and I want barakat in the house. I place a Quran and a mirror in the house so I can get barakat in the house. Or for instance, we see that there's a wedding and they want to send the girl home for the first time to the boy's house. What do they do? They bring the Quran and says to the girl, go under the Quran. The wedding has nothing to do with Islam. The wedding has nothing to do with Islam. But at that point we say, no, bring the Quran and let the girl go under the Quran. We found a very interesting story from Pakistan. There was a teacher. He wanted to make a library in the school. But since they didn't have the budget to buy books, he said to all the students, go home and bring me that book that is least used in your house so we can make the library in our school. The next day, all the children from in the school, which book did they come with? Everyone came with the Quran in different colors, in different shapes. This is how the Quran is. We have placed it so high up on the shelf. It's just collecting dust and nothing else. We don't use the Quran. We have forgotten that this book has come as a guidance for us. For example, we see that when a mother, a woman is pregnant with a child, she recites Quran a lot. She especially recites Surah Yusuf. When she knows it is a boy, she recites a lot of Surah Yusuf. And if it's a girl, she recites a lot of Surah Maryam. And it is recommended, our ulama has said it is recommended to recite those surahs so your child can get the beauty of Nabi Yusuf or the beauty from Lady Maryam. 
So the mother, she keeps reciting, keeps reciting. She recites it so much that she has memorized the surah. And I remember my teacher in Qum, he was saying, it seems like my mother, she used to recite surah and kaput. So I'm not saying that these ways are wrong way of using the Quran. But we need to understand why Quran has come to us. We take out the Quran in Ramadan. We know if you read one ayat in Ramadan, it is as if you have finished the whole Quran. It is as if you have finished the whole Quran. So we tend to read a lot of Quran in Ramadan. But as soon as the last day of Ramadan comes, we pack it back in that cloth and we put it back up in the shelf. We need to use the Quran constantly in our lives. Now let me give you an example from London. When I was living in London, one of my friends, I was with him in Kingsbury, in London, for those of you who know. And we were driving around in his car, and we came to the parking. We were supposed to go to a restaurant. We came to the parking. He stopped the car, and he opened up the, what do you call it, the dashboard pocket. He opened that up, and he took out the Quran, and he hanged it on the mirror in the middle. So I found it very strange that you hang the Qur'an when you park the car. Normally, we will think that people hang the Qur'an when they're driving around so the car is protected. No, he parked the car, he took out the Qur'an, and he hanged it up. So I asked him, brother, why did you hang the Qur'an now when you parked the car? He said, to be honest with you, this is a Muslim populated area, so when they see the Qur'an is hanging on the mirror, no one will steal from my car. Imagine, we have limited the Qur'an to this. Just to protect the car from other Muslims. We often see people, they take the Qur'an and they hang it around the neck and that they will feel protected and everything is good. They don't pray, they don't fast, they don't do other wajibat, but they will have the Qur'an around the neck. What is the point of having the Qur'an around the neck? We need to apply the teachings of the Qur'an in our lives, Quran has been sent as a book of guidance to us. To guide us towards perfection. And especially to my young brothers and sisters who are attending the majlis today. We need to know the messages of the Quran. What is my book saying? What is written in my book? Why I scrape it in my book? Why Allah sucked in my book? I need to know what has Allah written in the book. Because today in our society, when you find racist groups such as Stram Kush and Rasmus Paludan, where they're burning the Quran, they're throwing the Quran, our young generation, the youngsters are getting confused. They don't know how to defend it. We need to tell them what is in the Quran. We need to tell them what kind of messages are you burning in the Quran? What does the Quran, for example, say? Show goodness towards parents. Do not backbite. Do not lie. Do not fool other people. Be good towards others. Retaliation. Reconciliation. And do not mock other people. Take care of the poor people. Take care of orphans. Foreldralosa. Fatia. Take care of all of them. These are the messages that are in the Quran. And when these people are burning the Quran, these are the messages they are burning. They might say, you know what? We are burning the Quran because your prophet, na'udhu billah, was a prophet of war. He was a prophet of war. Then we need to tell them, don't be scared. We have answers of everything. We have answers to everything. Why do we have answers to everything? We are the followers of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salla ala Muhammad. And we are the followers of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam who said, Saluni, saluni, qablan tafqiduni. Ask me, ask me before you lose me. We are followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. We are strong in our personality. We can answer everyone. We have answers to everything. We will tell them. Don't study, don't look 
at the history from 1400 years ago with today's glasses. That is completely wrong. If you want to look at the history, use the history glasses of that time. And we need to analyze the history accordingly. There is a context to it. There is an answer to it. My respected brothers and sisters, especially the younger one, do not be shy of your identity. Be proud of being Muslim. I can promise you one thing. The brothers and sisters who are attending this majlis, the brothers and sisters who are the followers of the Holy Prophet, Ahlul Bayt, they are doing more for this country that anyone in Stramkush and any other groups like this will ever do for this country. So don't be shy. Don't be shy of your Muslim identity. Be proud. Be proud of yourself. Be proud of yourself. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So, my respected brothers and sisters, it is never late to learn about the Quran. It is never late to read or recite the Quran. I have a friend who went on Hajj with me, and he's, I think, 35 or 36 years old now. He recently learned how to recite the Quran. He said, how can it be that I die and I haven't learned how to read the Quran? Do not feel shy about it. And we should not look down upon those people who cannot read the Quran. Rather, we should help them how to recite the Quran. It is rather shameful that we die and we don't know how to recite the Quran. I remember one of my friends, he had lost his father. And he was sitting there crying and crying and crying. I went to him, I hugged him, I sent my condolences. I said to him, brother, I'm very sorry about the loss of your father. It is very sad. And I tried to comfort him. He said, I'm crying. Yes, I'm crying because I lost my father. But I'm crying more because I don't know how to read the Quran. How can I recite the Quran for my father? I don't know how to recite the Quran for the soul of my father. So dear brothers and sisters, it is never late for us to learn the Quran. Because remember, when we go down in the grave, the two angels will come to you. إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمَلَكَانَ الْمُقَرَّبَانَ الرَّسُولَيْنَ مِنْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ وَالسَّأَلَاكَ عَنْ رَبِّكَ عَنْ نَبِيِّكَ عَنْ قِبْلَتِكَ عَنْ دِينِكَ عَنْ, عن كِتَابِكَ when the two angels will come to the grave, those two angels were sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they will ask you, those two angels will ask you a question about your Lord. Who was your Lord? Who was your prophet? What was your qibla? Who are your imams? What is your religion? What is your book? What was your book? Are we able to reply that Quran was my book? That Allah was my Lord? We find the answers. This is from the Talqeen. لا تقف ولا تحزن. What a beautiful line. Do not fear and do not be sad. قل في جوابهما. Answer those two angels. إن الله عز وجل ربي. Surely Allah the exalted, he is my Lord. Inna Muhammadan sallallahu alayhi wa ala nabiyyi. Sure, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Wal Islamu dini. Wal Kaabatu qiblati. And Kaaba is my qibla, and Islam is my religion. Wal Quranu kitabi. And the Quran is my book. So how can I improve my relationship to Quran? Number one, let's ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help. Say, Ya Allah, sincerely from your heart, sincerely from your heart, say, Ya Allah, I wish to take a step towards you. 
I wish to take a step towards you. Ya Allah, help me. Give me power. Give me patience to be able to read and understand your holy book. Then the second thing we need to do. Read the Quran for a few minutes a day. We have about 1,440 minutes during the day. 1,440 minutes during the day. Can we take us five minutes to recite the Quran? But some might say, Sayyid Mawlana, I don't understand what I'm reading. Why should I read the Quran? And it is a legit question. I don't understand the Quran, so why should I read the Quran? And we find a very beautiful example that one of our teachers in Qum gave. He said, back in the days, in the village, they used to warm up the houses with coal. They used to have a bucket of coal. Now, there was a grandfather and a grandson. The grandson said to his father, Grandfather, I don't understand why I'm reading the Quran. I'm reading this, but I'm not understanding anything. I'm not understanding anything I'm reading. The grandfather said to his grandson, Take this bucket, take this bucket, and take it to the river and bring me water back. The grandson, he listened to his grandfather and he said, I will do that. He ran to the river, he took the bucket, and all of you know how bucket is, right? It is a bucket with holes on the side. So he places the bucket in the river and he tries to fill it up with water and he tries to run back towards the house. As soon as he runs towards the house, the water leaks out. Because there's holes in the bucket, the water leaks out. Again, he goes back to the river. He goes back to the river and he tries to fill up the bucket again. He fills it up and he runs towards the house. Again, water leaks out. He goes there for the third time, fourth time, fifth time. After last time he goes and fills it up, the water leaks out and he comes to his grandfather and he says, Grandfather, you told me to bring the water. But because of the holes in the bucket, the water leaked out. The grandfather said to him, My dear grandson, look inside the bucket. Look inside the bucket which had coal. He said, what can you see? He said, Grandfather, this bucket used to be black on the inside. It used to be black on the inside. Now it has been cleansed. Now it is completely white and clean inside. The grandfather said, it is the same way. When we read the Quran, we might sometimes not understand it. It might leak out of ourselves, but it cleanses our soul. It cleans our soul. So we need to try to read the Quran. And the third point that the ulama say is that we need to try to listen to Quran. When you're driving the car, when you're sitting in the traffic, try to listen to the Quran. And I can promise you, when you listen to the Quran, it will change your heart. It is shifa'a in the Quran. It is healing in the Quran. And I'm going to tell you a personal experience when it comes to Quran. My father-in-law, Hujjat al-Islam al-Muslim Mawlana Sayyid Najm al-Hassan, when Corona came, he went into coma. He became very ill from Corona. He went to coma for three weeks. Three weeks he was in coma. His oxygen level had dropped down to 30%. And I know there are doctors sitting here. They know how critical that is. His oxygen level had dropped down to 30%. He was on a ventilator. The doctor told us, there is no hope. There is no hope. There is no hope for him. And in our house, it became Aza. We were crying. We were shedding our tears. Because he is very dear to us. We love him. And it is too early for us to say goodbye to him. We were not ready to say goodbye to him. My mother-in-law said, this cannot be the end. She took an MP3 player 
as she placed Surah Rahman, the file of Surah Rahman, on that MP3 player. And she gave it to the doctor. And she said to the doctor, please play this file in front of him. Imagine, doctor told us there is no hope. And this is a personal experience I'm telling you from my own life. They played Surah Rahman in front of him. After two days, he woke up. Sallu ala Muhammad wa alim. So there is shifa'a in the Qur'an. Use the Qur'an. Qur'an will guide us. It will take us towards perfection. And the fourth point is that we need to listen to lectures about the Qur'an. Increase our understanding about the Qur'an. And the fifth point that we need to focus on, it is that we need to download an app which is called Nakhtimul Qur'an. And I haven't been paid by this organization to say this to you, okay? We should download this app called Nakhtimul Qur'an. What does it do? Every single time you open up the phone, before you can use the phone, a verse of Qur'an comes up. So you have to read the verse of the Qur'an, then you can start using the, your phone. And we know how many times you use the phone every single minute. You're taking up the phone, you're looking at the screen. What if my friend said, by having this app, I finished the Qur'an in three days. So, download this app. It is a very good app. And in this way, you'll be able to recite the Qur'an on a daily basis, or even on a minute basis, or even a second basis. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So this is in terms of that tool when we wish to, that Allah speaks to us. Now if I wish to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I need to conduct the prayers. I need to conduct the salat. And we know when we conduct the salat, most of the time when we raise our hands and we say Allahu Akbar, we go on autopilot mode. We go on autopilot mode, right? Especially when there is a jama'ah. When there is an imam, alhamdulillah. He says, Allahu Akbar, and we start thinking about the politics in Iraq and in Pakistan. We start thinking about the weddings of Fulan and Fulan, about this, about that, about everything, about how Manchester City is doing so well in Champions League, and so on and so forth. We start thinking about every single thing. Why is it like that? If we understand the philosophy of the prayers, we will see that our prayers will change. Now let me tell you another story from London. And many things happen in London. Let me tell you another story from London. This is one of my friends was telling me. So there is a center in Tooting area, which is in southern London, called Idara Jafiriya. And one of my friends, a very dear friend, close friend, he was there and they recited Salatul Jumu'ah there. And he was waiting for his friend to come and join the prayers. But his friend and father, they were late because of the traffic in London. And you know how chaos the traffic in London is. So his friend and the father, they were late. Salat al Jumu'ah had finished. Most of the people had left. My friend was sitting in the back of the room waiting for his friend. The friend and the father came inside the musalla. And they were thinking, let's pray together at least. We missed the Salat al Jumu'ah. Let us pray together. So the father stands in the front and the son stands next to him. How you pray two people, jama'ah? The son, he stands next to his father. My friend is sitting in the back of the room and he's saying to me, they started the prayer, they said takbiratul ihram, they said Allahu Akbar and they started. He said when they came to the first ruku', he said it is the longest ruku' I have seen in my life. He said, I think that the ruku lasts for 10 or 15 minutes. I said, how come? A ruku doesn't take more than 30 seconds, one minute. For some brothers, five seconds. 10 minutes ruku. What happened? That it took 10 minutes in the ruku. My friend told me that when the father went in ruku and the son also went in ruku, the son had cigarettes in the front pocket here. So when he went in ruku, the cigarette packet fell down. So the father was looking at the cigarettes 
and the sun was looking at the cigarettes. And for 10 minutes they were standing there like that. I wonder what went through the head of the father and the son. The, son, the father was probably thinking, you know, should, should I use, use the slippers or the belt or something like that? Or, and the son was thinking, I need to run away from here. So many things can happen during the prayer. We need to understand the philosophy of the prayer. For example, we have this mahrab here. You see this arch. In Norwegian, we call it nisha. I don't know what you call it in Sweden, but I think it's something similar. Mahrab. Mahrab comes from the word harb, which means in Arabic what? War. Can you think about the association between those two? We find a very beautiful story from the life of the Holy Prophet where one of his companions went into the war. And when they went into the war, they gave everything in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One, one of the companions of the Prophet, he was fighting and he had a sword in his hand and he was fighting through. Suddenly, one of the enemies attacked him and they cut half of his arm. But because he was defending the Holy Prophet, he saw that this arm is stopping him. So what did he do? He cut his arm off and he continued to fight until he became martyr, until he became shaheed. Meaning he had 100% focus in what he was doing. So when we are praying, we need to have 100% focus in our prayers. So, for instance, when I raise my hands and I say, Allahu Akbar, what is the meaning of that when i say allahu akbar we do it many times during the prayer when i say allahu akbar what does it mean i'm raising my hand and i'm saying allahu akbar god is great what is the meaning of it this means the philosophy behind it is that oh allah i'm throwing the whole world behind me and i'm standing in front of you what about the sujood? We are in sujood. We sit up and then we go back down to the sujood and we come back up. What is the meaning behind this? What is the meaning behind this sujood? And the answer to this, the philosophy behind this, we find it from Amir al Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, where he says in Nahjul Balagha, someone comes and asks him, Mawla, what is the meaning of this sujood? Imam Ali salam says in the most beautiful ways. He says, when you are in sujood and you sit up for the first time, it means that you have been born. And when you go down again, it means that you're going to die. And when you get up for the second time, it means resurrection. That you're going to stand up again. This is the philosophy of sujood. There are many other points you could mention, but due to the limitation of time, I'm not able to say it. Just see what is the meaning of reciting Surah Al-Hamd. What is the meaning of reciting Surah Al-Fatiha in the prayer? For each ayat you're reciting, Allah is answering you. Imagine the creator of heavens and earth is answering me and you. We are nothing in this world. We are less an atom in this world. The Creator, He answers us. You should look at the hadith and see how Allah answers us. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now, I want to speak to the brothers and sisters. Some might feel offended by this but I want to say it with pure love for our fellow brother and sister in faith there are two types of people there are two types of people those who pray and those who don't pray and first I would like to speak to those who don't pray there might be some in this room and I would like to address you and it is out of pure love that I'm saying this point. This is because I want us together to move towards perfection. A person who is not praying. There might be different reasons. 
various reasons for why this person is not praying. He might have not been introduced to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the correct manner, in the correct way. Everything has been force, force, and force. Allah, He loves the humans. Allah, He wants us to move towards perfection. He says, Oh my creation, I want you to move towards perfection. I have created this tool for you. I've created this tool for you. If you do one good action, I will give you ten times that action. Let us reflect upon the blessings that has been given from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us think about that. Let us increase the understanding of our religion. To follow the religion, prayers, it is not an easy task. It is difficult. It is indeed difficult. If someone today is sitting here today and they don't conduct their wajibat, they don't conduct their five wajib prayers during the day, respected brothers and sisters, today, on the day of Arba'in, you have come here for the love of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Pay allegiance to Imam today. Pay allegiance to the Imam of your time and say, Oh Mawla, Ya Mawla, Oh Master of my time, I wish to take steps towards you. I haven't understood the prayers properly. I really want to come close to you. Start by saying to yourself, From today, I will start with conducting one salat, one namaz, one prayer I will conduct. Just because of today's majlis, don't start and do all five straight away and you start doing the salat layl on all the mustahabbat and everything. No, 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 no. We want a gradually change. A gradually change is a change that would last. If you can't stand up for fajr prayers, salat al dhuhr as you're in job, you're in school, it's embarrassing to pray in front of friends. Maghrib, you're alone at home. Let's you're out even then. Tayyib. It's at Salat al-Isha at home. Start with one prayer and you will see that slowly, slowly the other prayers will come into your life. It doesn't mean that I've started and I've lost a lot of prayers. It means that I can forget them. No, we have an outstanding bill. I have an outstanding bill. I have to pay that bill back. But we need to understand the prayer. The prayer has not come as a punishment to us. Rather, it has come as love from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are some people who say, I will start praying when I stop sinning. I will start praying when I do this. I will start praying, for example, when I wear hijab. It is not like that. We have a narration from the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he says, Peace be upon his name. Allah, salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Surely his prayer will stop him from committing the sins one or another day and he will change. This is in Bihar al-Anwar, volume 82, page 198. Teach your children from young age. Bring them to the musalla. If they're playing, let them play. If you're praying and then playing, let them play in front of you. And we need to teach all our children. That's what I'm Let them play. Let them play around us. Don't get angry on them. Don't force them. This tool has come as love, as mercy. Let us introduce it to them in the same way. Don't leave bad memories with your children when it comes to prayers. If they're hungry, if they're thirsty, if they're tired, don't force them. Slowly, slowly teach your children. I know of one guy, he used to get angry on his child because he did not used to wake up for Salatul Layl. He used to get angry on his child because he didn't used to wake up for Salatul Layl. And his son was two years old. La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala Peace be upon the salawat. Allahumma salli ala So let children be children 
and respected brothers and sisters and elders sitting here today. Pray as a family. Husband, wife and children can pray together as a jama'ah. We can learn this from our brothers from Ahl Sunnah. How they pray as a family, how they pray together. We can actually pray together as our own family. You don't have to be a maulan or imam to lead the jama'ah in your family. Jama'ah in your family is a point of tarbiyah, of upbringing. So pray together, husband, wife and children, you can pray together. So now I would like to shortly, I see my time is running out. I would sh quickly just address the second group who are those who pray but don't lose concentration during the prayer. And just for the first group who does not pray, remember, I mentioned all these points out of pure love for you. Because we share the same faith and belief. So second group, if you struggle with the concentration, there are certain steps you can take. When, for example, you are doing wudu, think about the purity of the water. Think about whenever you put that water on your face, your face becomes filled with noor. Take moderate food. Don't eat too much. Wear nice clothes. Put perfume on. Make yourself ready for prayers in the same way you, when you're going to someone's house. And the second point is focus. Think about who you're standing in front of. You're standing in front of your creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have a very beautiful saying from Imam Ali alayhi salam where he says, I did not pray because of fear of the punishment because that would be the prayer of the slave. I did not pray because of wish for reward because that would be like a businessman, a tajir. Rather, I prayed out of my love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is the free person. So, whenever you pray, think that this is your last prayers. And see how it will change. These two tools which I mentioned to you. The tools of communication. The Quran and the prayers. It is very important for us to take them close to our lives. To keep them close to our lives. So we can build a relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember the Quran and the prayers. It was very important for the Holy Prophet and the Al, the family of the Holy Prophet. On the night of Ashura, which is known as Tasu'a, we see that the family of the Holy Prophet, Imam Hussein, his brother, his children, the woman, everyone is sitting together and reciting the Holy Quran. They are reciting the prayers. It was their last night. As you know, on the day of Ashura, a lot of calamities happened upon the family of the Holy Prophet. After the first night of Ashura, the women, they were going to go through a lot of torture, a lot of pain. And then we find the day after Ashura, when the enemies came, they came now to take the woman as captives. It is the first time someone is going to take the daughters of Rasulullah as captives. Imagine the enemies came with ropes and they tightened the hand of Sayyida Zainab Salamullah alayha. They, take, they took her as a prisoner, as a captive and they made her march towards Kufa. Do you know the misfortune that fell upon her? Sayyida Zainab, when she used to enter Kufa, her father, when he was governor at that time, he used to tell his son, Imam Hassan alayhi salam, he used to say to his son, Oh my son, my Zainab is coming towards Kufa now. My Zainab is coming towards Kufa now. Tell everyone to go inside their houses. Don't let anyone come out. I don't want anyone to see even the shadow of my Zainab. But after the shahadat of Imam Hussain alayhi salam, when they took her as a prisoner towards Kufa, Ibn Ziyad Mal'oon, what did he say? He said, wait until the daylight comes. 
so everyone can see the daughters of Zahra parading through Kufa. And last time, before this, when Sayyida Zainab came to Kufa, and her, on her right side she had Imam Hassan alayhi salam, on her left side she had Imam Hussein alayhi salam, on one side she had Abi Fadl Abbas alayhi salam. But now, on one side she had Umar ibn Sa'ad, on one side she had Shimr. On each side she had the oppressors around her and in front of her was the head of her brother on the spear. This is the dhulm that she went through. This is the injustice she went through. They took her through Kufa and she, they took her to the palace of Ibn Ziyad and a lot of conversation happened. We don't have time to go through them. Then they took this, this woman towards Sham, towards Damascus and we find an incident. We find an incident where one of the companions of the Holy Prophet, Sahal ibn Sa'ad al-Sa'idi, he was returning from Jerusalem. He came to Damascus and he saw that people are cheering, people are happy, people are celebrating. He went around and asked them, why are you celebrating, O people of Damascus? Why are you so happy? People of Damascus said, they say the outlaws are coming. Those who are fighting against Amir al-Mu'mineen Yazid, they are coming towards Damascus. Then Sahal ibn Sa'ad al-Sa'idi, he went through the streets. He saw one old man sitting there. He was crying out loudly. Sahal ibn Sa'ad al-Sa'idi went to him he said to him oh old man why are you crying so much when everyone is celebrating this old man said to him haven't you heard haven't you heard what has happened he said no I don't know about anything I have just returned from Jerusalem I'm coming back for Jerusalem this person said who are you he said I'm Sahal ibn Sa'ad al-Sa'idi I'm the companion of the holy prophet this old man said to him my sincere condolences to you. So haven't you heard um, that the grandson of the Holy Prophet had been slaughtered? Uh, he has become shaheed. Uh, when Sahal heard this, uh, he asked this old man, from which gate are they coming into Damascus? Uh, this old man tells him they are going to come from Babu Sa'ad. Uh, they are coming to come from the gate of Sa'ad. Uh, Sahal ibn Sa'ad al-Sa'adi moves towards there. When he comes to that gate, uh, he sees that caravan is coming uh, on the spears. It is the heads of the shohada. It is the heads of the shohada. In front of the heads, uh, it is women uh, walking there with robes on their hands. Uh, and then suddenly he sees uh, the son of Imam Hussein, uh, Imam Sajjad alayhi salam. Uh, the sounds of chains and shackles were coming. Uh, he sees that Imam Imam Sajjad is wearing a red shirt. Uh, shirt. He asks Imam Sajjad, uh, he says he approaches Imam Sajjad uh, and he says, Yabna Rasulillah, it is not normal for you to wear red shirt. Why are you wearing red shirt? Then suddenly Sahil sees uh, it is from the blood uh, or from the collar that Imam Sajjad had around his neck. Uh, on this collar there were spikes, uh, they were piercing through the neck of Imam Sajjad. From that he was bleeding. Uh, Imam Sajjad says to Sahel, uh, he said, Oh Sahel, uh, peace be upon you, O companion of my grandfather. Uh, can I ask you something? Sahel says to him, uh, Yabna Rasulillah, ask me anything and I will grant it to you. He says, Oh Sahel, uh, do you have any money? Sahel says, Yes, I have money. Sahel says, yeah, I have money. What do you want me to do with them? Uh, Imam Sajjad says to him, Oh Sahel, take this money, take that money and pay those people uh, who are carrying the spears uh, with the head of Abba Abdullah al Hussein, with the heads of Shahada, and tell them to walk in the front. Uh, so all the people around Damascus uh, are looking at the heads of Shahada and not on the haram of Rasulullah and not at the woman of Rasulullah. Jazakum Rabbukum. We find in the history that this group of people become to, they come to the palace of Yazid. They come to the palace of Yazid. A lot of conversation happened. A lot of conversation happened. 
And Yazid says to Sayyidah Zainab, are you happy? Are you pleased with what Allah has done to you? What did Sayyidah Zainab say? She is our truly inspiration. What did she say? Wallahi ma ra'aytu jameela. I haven't seen anything except beauty from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was a lot of conversation forth and back. But then we find after some time, after a few days imprisonment, uh, this caravan, they walk towards Karabala. On the other side, uh, we find one of the companions of the Holy Prophet, uh, Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari. He was blind at that time because he was very old. The history tells us when he finds out about the martyr death of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he asks the people around, uh, where is Karbala? He asks his companion Atiyah. He says, oh Atiyah, show me where Karbala is. Uh, he takes him towards Karbala. They walk towards Karbala. When they are close to Karbala, when they are close to Karbala, Jabir ibn Abdullah al Ansari says to Atiyah, he says, Show me the grave. Just take me to the grave of Imam Hussein. Atiyah says to him, Oh Jabir, I cannot tell you which grave belongs to Imam Hussein because there is no name on the grave. What did Jabir ibn Abdullah al Ansari do? He said, I know I can find the grave. He went to the first grave he picked up some dirt he smelled on that dirt he said no this is not the grave of Abu Abdullah al Hussein he placed the dirt down then he went to second grave to the third grave and then he went forward the furthermore to the next grave then suddenly he came to one grave he picked up the soil from that grave and he smelled that and when he smelled that he yelled out assalamu alaikum ya Abu Abdullah al Hussein Hussein, uh, peace and blessings be upon you, Abba Abdullah al Hussein. Uh, suddenly, Atiyah comes to Jabir. Uh, he says, Oh, Jabir, uh, there is a caravan approaching us. Uh, Jabir says, Which caravan is it? Uh, when they came close to him, Atiyah says to Jabir, Oh, Jabir, uh, it is Sajjad who's coming. Uh, it is the woman of uh, Imam Hussein. It is the woman from the family of the Holy Prophet coming. Uh, when Imam Sajjad came to him. Uh, Jabir ibn Abdullah Ansari said to Imam Sajjad, Azam Allah laka al-ajr. My condolences to you. Then he threw himself on the feet of Imam Sajjad. He started kissing the feet of Imam Sajjad. He sent his condolences to Imam Sajjad. Um, last point and he will go to dua. We find in the history that every woman they threw themselves upon the grave of their shaheed. Uh, Farwa, she threw herself on the grave of Qasim. Uh, Rabab, she threw herself upon the grave of Ali al Akbar. Another person threw herself on the grave of her shaheed. Uh, but Sayyida Zainab, what did Sayyida Zainab do? Sayyida Zainab went crying. Uh, she went crying to the grave of Abi Fadl Abbas. Uh, and she he shouted out, Oh Abbas, look at your Zainab. You were supposed to protect her, but her chadr was taken from her. Her whale was taken from her. She was taken as a prisoner through Kufa and Sham. Ala la'natullahi ala al-qawm al-zalimin Sayalamu al-ladheena zalamu ayyamun qalabin yanqalibun wa la'aqibatu lil-muttaqeen